what a pleasure I have standing with a good friend, the Professor Emeritus of Law at Harvard University, Harvard Law School, Alan Dershowitz, who as you know is one of the greatest defenders, not only of the state of Israel, and he is, but also of American liberal principles and the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights, and it's always wonderful, wonderful talking to you. Thank you. Unfortunately, this has been a hard week, and the audience knows we're taping at the end of the week of the Harnoff tragedy. We also are taping in the midst of the shadow of the decision that's going to come out vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian sanctions and the Iranian deal. But I wanted you to just talk for one moment from the heart, Alan. How do you feel when you heard about what happened at Harnoff? And does it change anything for you? Or is it simply a tragic event, but it is what it is? Well, first of all, I'm here because I want to promote <coughs> unity within the pro-Israel community. I'm a liberal, my views are a little different than this organization's, but I want to stand together with them and defend Israel. I knew one of the rabbis, uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Tursky. Uh, he was a Harvard student, his father was a Harvard professor, his grandfather I admired enormously and knew uh, well. And so for me, there was a personal element of the tragedy as well as, of course, a political uh, and Jewish element of the tragedy. It's not a game changer. Uh, Iran developing nuclear weapons would be a game changer, uh, tragically. And I just hope that if the president makes a bad deal, Congress doesn't let him carry it out. Congress has a very important role to play in foreign policy. And anybody who believes that foreign policy is only the State Department and the White House doesn't understand the Constitution. Congress has to play an important role, and this deal should not allow to go, be allowed to go through unless Congress approves it. Alan, you already mentioned your views are not synchronous with the views of the ZOA, and yet you're here to promote unity. There are many people who are here who are very disappointed, and some are angry at the President of the United States, and they feel the American administration's relationship to Israel, and more particularly the relationship between Barack Obama and Bibi Netanyahu, has not been productive or good. I want to know if you try to balance that, or in, in some way, Ellen, are you also disappointed with some of the things that have come out of the administration vis-a-vis -vis the state of Israel? I am disappointed. I was very disappointed with the president's statement following the Harnoff massacre, yes. in which he tried to create a kind of balance, yes. condemning the massacre, but then kind of talking about how many Palestinians have died. That was a time to simply condemn the massacre in unequivocal terms. The president was wrong in his tone, was wrong in his content. And I like President Obama, I voted for him twice. I feel very comfortable criticizing him and saying that I'm disappointed in some of his policies. I'm holding my fire, however, to see what happens in Iran, because that's the most important issue faced by Israel today. And if he makes a bad deal, I will not hold my fire. I don't want to see President Obama become the Neville Chamberlain of the 21st century. Have you ever had a chance to sit with major Palestinian leaders in Ramallah or anywhere else? I have. I've met with all of them. I've met with Abbas on uh, several occasions. I've met with former Prime Minister Fayyad. I've met with other leaders uh, over time. And you know, when they speak to me, they're wonderful. <laughs> they're just wonderful. Do you believe them? They would make peace tomorrow when they speak with me in English. <laughs> but when they speak to their street and their constituents, it's a different language. Okay. And that's what I wanted you to speak to for one moment to the JBS audience. Because, you know, in part, a person's position, whatever the position is, is formed by what he believes or she believes are the facts. I'm having a hard time, Alan, honing in on what is fact and not. So there's a question. Do you believe factually Mahmoud Abbas is a moderate, not in relationship to others, but intrinsically, is he a moderate who wants peace, and the only reason he hasn't been able to create it with the state of Israel is that his hands are tied. But as you, or, you know, I, I talked to Itamar Marcus, who says to me, look at what they're putting on the Palestinian website. Look what they're putting on Palestinian uh, mm -hmm. television. Yeah. Look what they are, how they're inciting people. And even when Abbas condemned the murders at Harnov, he also said it was Israel's fault. I want to know from your experience and your perspective, what do you believe is true about Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian leadership of the Palestinian Authority as it is constituted today? 
I don't believe um, Abbas is a moderate. I believe he's a pragmatist. I believe that he espouses moderation when he thinks moderation will help his cause. But he will go as far as he can, consistent with what his pragmatic goals are. In his heart, he's not a moderate. In his heart, he would prefer to see no Israel. Yes. Last question, only because I have you. And you have this enormous ability to both interpret and explain the Constitution of the United States. Would you please speak to the issue that's all over the news? Did the President of the United States do something unconstitutional in the immigration policy? The answer is crystal clear. No one knows. <laughs> Anybody who says they know the answer to that question, that it's either clearly constitutional or clearly unconstitutional, is selling you a bill of goods. This is uncharted area. I do not blame the President for trying, and I do not blame the Republicans for opposing him. This is an area in flux. You are one. There's no one like you. By the way, What's your guess? Will it stand the Supreme Court test? Guess. I you know the Supreme Court. It will, but it will be a very close vote. Okay. No one like you, Alan. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. Alan Dershowitz. I'm here with Jeff Wiesenfeld, a major personality in New York's Jewish community. Jeff, we're here at the ZOA dinner, and I know you pick your dinners carefully. How come you're here tonight? What is it that you're trying to support? It's, it's worth it just to be in a room for a few hours with people who get it, who are sane, who knows what's really going on, as opposed to people whose, cloud, whose heads are in the clouds while our situation becomes more and more deteriorated and dangerous. Jeff, um, I think that's an interesting expression, heads in the clouds. Can you tell us a little bit what you mean by that? I think that I'll, I'm going to say something that's heretical, that's going to cause a lot of problems, because I've been thinking about it and I've been speaking to some people just this past week. Namely, we have a big Jewish infrastructure, and they're all dedicated people. And we all support APAC as well, not just ZOA. And we believe in it. And we believe in the President's Conference, because that's, that's, these are our spokespeople. The problem is they've relied too much on access to the White House. And access to this White House, this particular White House, has been of no value to us. It's a destructive administration in every way, shape, and form. And I, I believe, I've spoken to some people, that we have to do something totally different. I believe with or without the establishment, there should be funding provided by good Jewish people. I don't tell people how to spend their money, but people like Sheldon Ad Adelson, like Steve Wynn, like Chaim Saban, people from both sides who are well endowed and would fund a million Christians and Jews to come to Washington and put every senator and congressman on the spot and say, are you for this administration's deal with Iran, which jeopardizes Israel, or are you standing with us? And once and for all, all of those people who say they're with us, but really have kowtowed to this administration, which is about to make a horrific deal with Iran, would have to stand up. And some of them are very close to us here in New York. We have to have real answers. We have to know they're with us. They don't sponsor a bill. And then when the administration says walk away, they walk away. This requires now organizing really if you really want to have a solution we have to show that we could stand as a million Jews and Christians together in Washington and I know that all of the ZOA base would come I know that the Christians United for Israel would go I know that Pastor Haggy's congregation and his supporters would go I know that there are people right there that we have as a base of about 50 to 100,000 people we need a million people in Washington and we need people who will step forward who can fund this because this will require buses and other arrangements but it's no more business as usual the idea of just having access to the white house is of no value to us we have the access and where has it gotten us for our viewers who are watching um what jeff is referring to it's november 23rd we are literally on the eve of the iran nuclear talks taking place between the p5 plus one right now and jeff you know we've been hearing over and over again that november 25th was really and truly the final deadline and there would be no further extensions and what social media and uh, the news out there seems to be buzzing about is that it looks like we are indeed going to give the Iranians another extension on the deadline. And I think many of us are wondering what is to be gained by extending the deadline. So, Jeff, let's say we have our dreams come true and a million people, Jews and Christians, together storm the White House. What is it that you're hoping we'll accomplish with that? It's not storming the White House. We want every senator and congressmen in the United States, most of whom would, si would sign on with us, to sign a declaration, including those who are good Democrats who have been with us, but they must defy the White House, and they must stand with us, and they must say, we know this administration is wrong, 
They're wrong-headed about this agreement. We know that either way Iran is going to be able to proceed to a bomb in, very quick, in a very quick instance because of the way the agreement will end. The sanctions have to be put back into place, and we want those people either to appear, our congressmen and our senators, or to be on the record on this declaration that they defy the White House. There comes a time in history that this administration is wrong, as wrong as Roosevelt was in not allowing Jews into this country. And if we don't stand up now, where APAC, which we all support, has a $105 million budget to make beautiful videos, and the most important thing is that the conference have appearing, the president, the vice president, the secretary of state. You can take all of three of these people, and you know what you can do with them as far as I'm concerned. They have not been allies of the state of Israel. The military is close to the state of Israel because they realize the value of Israel. The American people are with Israel because they realize our values. This administration's heart has not been with Israel. It's been a facade, and it's time to call it out. And we need everyone in this organization and in the Jewish establishment to be compelled to go to Washington and to ask every senator and congressman to go on the record. And the ones that won't go on the record against this White House, with its faulty agreement, which it's about to undertake, will be exposed once and for all. Jeff Wiesenfeld, thank you for joining us on JBA. Thank you. I'm now standing with, when I say a dear friend, this is one of the good guys in the Jewish world. Charles Small is the founding director of ISCAP, the Institute for the Study of Anti-Semitism. Uh, wait, wait, why do I always get the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy? So here we are at the ZOA dinner, and at the moment, as we meet, there are two things that are buzzing around the room. Number one, and the audience understands, by the time they see this, it'll be a week later, whatever. But as you talk to people now, they're still reeling, reeling from the incident at the synagogue in Harnof. And I want to start there with you. Then we'll talk about the second thing, which is Iran. But well, first of all, I'd love to know what your personal reaction was. And this is my real question for you, Charles. I've had people say to me, this will be a watershed event. Others have said it's a tragic event, but it won't change the landscape in any way. I wonder how you felt when you heard it, and from your perspective, how significant an event is it beyond the tragedy itself? Well, uh, I, don't know. I don't know if I have the words to say what, uh, what it means. I think it's, um, it's predictable. First of all, one of our ISGAP workers, her cousin, was badly wounded in the attack. Really? Yeah. Who was that? Uh, Rothman from Toronto. He's been there. He's been in Jerusalem a long time. And Michelle Whiteman, who runs ISGAP Canada, it's her first cousin. I'm very sorry. Yeah, so it really touched the ISGAP family, and it touched all, all of us, the whole Jewish community internationally. The tragedy for me is the tragedy aspect of it is that it's predictable. Jews are perceived by radical political Muslims as animals, as contaminants that need to be removed from Islamic land. And our community needs to read and needs to study and understand who our enemy is. These are not crazy people acting on the spur of the moment. These are people that are instructed by an ideology of hatred to, to kill Jews. And President Obama's reaction never, ever, ever touches upon the ideology of this regime, of this social movement. And we, this is a pogrom. A pogrom, a pogrom connotes organized uh, killing by a state or a social movement. This social movement is instructing its members to kill Jews. Okay. And I want to interrupt only because I've heard many people say to me, these, these two kids acted alone. They were not sent by Hamas. They may have been influenced by the incitement and the rhetoric, but they were not part of a formal group. What do you say? Well, Hamas praised it because it's in keeping with the ideology. The Jordanian parliament had a moment of silence for the killers, not for the victims, because it's in keeping with the Brotherhood's ideology. And when, when Obama talks about terrorist attacks and the, this sort of moral relativism, which uh, Alan Dershowitz finally stood up and said it's enough, um, we as a community need to really understand what's happening and call on the American government to condemn this ideology. This is the same ideology that President Obama praised, praised in the General Assembly in September of 2014, just a couple of months ago. This ideology meet, needs to be called out and stopped, and our government, the, the leaders of the free world, the, the most powerful country in the free world, needs to stand unequivocally and condemn this brutal ideology that promotes literally genocide. The head of the Muslim Brotherhood, Kawadari, 
literally calls for the Mo for Muslims to continue the work of Adolf Hitler. This is the ideology, and this ideology needs to be confronted at all levels, politically and unfortunately militarily. Okay, address the second part of the question. There are some people who have said to me that Palestinians would go into a synagogue and would use axes on Jews in prayer. They happen to be rabbis, but they really were simply Jews praying in a synagogue, Amida. in a quote, house of God, yes, a house of God. Um, that somehow that resonates differently with people. I've heard other people say, and you know, we spoke to Dershowitz already, and Alan says it was a terrible event, but he doesn't believe it's a watershed. I want your sense. Well, it's not a watershed because the world, the international community is not reacting, number one. And number two, since this barbarism of a week ago, six days ago, the same ideology is operating in Nigeria. 43 people were, were killed in Nigeria. In Kenya, just last night, a group of Al-Shabaab, another radical Islamist organization with the same ideology, went onto a bus, asked people to recite Muslim prayers, and those who couldn't recite the Muslim prayers were literally executed. 28 people on a bus in Kenya were executed because they weren't Muslims. This ideology has no respect for people who are different than them. And this is a, 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 not only appalling, but it's a real threat to democratic principles internationally. I've asked you this before. I want you to speak to it one more time. What you understand, there must be people in the American administration and in the State Department who understand it also. Yet I don't hear any of it. And not only that, I, I hear the moral relativism that comes out of the President of the United States after really Jews were butchered. And I'm wondering from your perspective, why, what's going on inside the halls of government? And I'm talking now about the administration. Well, I don't know what's in people's hearts. I only know what they're doing, what their actions are. And their actions and their silence is appalling. He, he, President Obama offended many Canadians just a few weeks ago when we last met, when 20 minutes before Stephen Harper was calling an international news conference, Obama came on American TV and he said, we don't know, it's too early to tell what happened. 20 minutes later, Prime Minister Stephen Harper stood up and said that there was a terrorist attack by a radical Islamist in the center of our, the halls of democracy in the Canadian Parliament, and he unequivocally condemned it. Why can't the American government condemn this Barbarism. Why? Uh, you have to ask them. But the fact that they don't is appalling. I appreciate you so much. Our audience appreciates you. Kol Tuba yes. You keep yes, up the good work. We'll speak often. You too. You're very important work for our community Thank and for you. truth. Charles Small. I'm here with Mortimer Zuckerman, who is former chair of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. Mort, may I call you that? Um, we're here at the ZOA dinner, and I'm just curious, why are you supporting ZOA yourself? Well, uh, because uh, I'm, uh, as you probably gathered from my previous reference, been very active in support of Israel for my entire adult life. And this organization is one of the leaders in that entire effort. And Alan Dershowitz is also an extraordinary voice on behalf of the issues that Israel has to contend with. He's very knowledgeable, he's very articulate, and, and is very valuable in that effort because, as we all know, this does not happen by accident that we get uh, the support of the United States, particularly in these days. So it's very important that we all show up where we have to show up. Mort, a lot of people would say that um, ZOA takes a somewhat different approach from some of the other Jewish organizations that are here to support Israel. What do you think about ZOA's approach, and do you think that's, that's something that the U.S. Jewish community should be doing more of? Look, I think and I, when I was chairman of the conference, okay, there was a diversification of, view, of views. People went from one end of the political spectrum to the other. The whole idea is to have a tent under which all of us who care about Israel can get together and figure out how we can speak with a common voice, with a common objective. And one of our major objectives is always to support Israel, which is always under literally vital, they need vital support because they are under vital threats. Mort, this week we um, had a tragic event, as you know, with uh, four Israeli Jews in uh, synagogue and prayer who were who were massacred by uh, terrorists. What is your message for for Israeli for the Israeli people and, and anyone in our audience who may be watching from Israel? 
The sad fact is that we are and have been a persecuted people for centuries. Never more so than what's going on in Israel from a rabid and radical Palestinian community. It makes it very difficult to figure out how they could live together when these kinds of events happen. But we just have to be determined and hang in there. Sooner or later, we'll work out a modus vivendi, and this will eliminate. But in the meantime, it is a real shame that the Palestinians or the radicals resort to this kind of behavior against an absolutely innocent group of people. It just makes my, it makes my stomach turn over and it, it just hardens my own determination to do whatever I can yeah, to support Israel. Mort, um, we are now uh, filming please this evening lights, on the eve of the uh, deadline for the Iran nuclear talks, the P5 plus one talks that are taking place. And we've, we've been told over and over again that tomorrow, November 25th, is the final deadline for these talks. And there seems to be um, a fair amount of media buzz that uh, these uh, negotiations may be extended further. Do you have any thoughts on uh, where you'd like to see our government take the nuclear negotiations with Iran? Yes, of course. I mean, the critical issue is to make sure that Iran never has the capacity in the future, as well as in the present, to develop the nuclear weapons that is a mortal and vital threat to Israel. Whether or not this administration in Washington is willing to take that position and push it. It's something we do not know because they have not shown the kind of support for Israel that I had originally hoped when they came into office. But we're going to find out. I think the Secretary of State, John Kerry, really believes that he will not ever do anything to harm Israel. He has said this in many different venues. We will find out what now, what comes out of this thing, and I hope he's right when we look at the results of this particular negotiation, because this is the most strategic threat to the very existence of Israel that we are going to have to consider over the next decade. Mort, you know, a lot of people who are here tonight have expressed to me that perhaps our hope lies in, a, in a, the new Republican Congress. Do you think that is where we should be looking forward to? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly the, we'll find out really whether or not the the views of the Republicans in the Congress, which uh, it's hard really to exactly measure it, have been much tougher in terms of their dealing with the Palestinians and their dealings on, particularly with the Iranians on this issue. Whether this will be the policy of this administration, we just don't know. But it's certainly going to help to have their views expressed very publicly and very forcefully. More, you know, when you look at the world stage right now, you've got um, the growing presence of ISIS all over the Middle East, Iraq, Syria. Um, you've got Hamas getting strengthened in some ways, even post the, uh, the Gaza conflict this summer. I, we hear from our audience sometimes that they're very worried. Do you think this is a moment of worry and concern for the I, American I, Jewish I, community? I, I have to say this. I have been worried about Israel for about 40 years now, maybe even 50 years. I suspect that I will be worried about them for the next several decades, or at least as long as I'm alive. So that's, that's the given that we have to live with. What we do not have to live with is a government in Washington that doesn't support Israel, which has been, by and large, the pattern of most of the previous governments that we've had coming out of Washington. This government in Washington is the one that makes me the most nervous about their support for Israel and whether or not they abandon Israel at a cr critical moment like this when literally Israel's absolute existence is under threat. We're going to find out sooner. Okay, Mort, so my final question for you. Um, for all those people who may be watching us and who are supporters of Israel, what would you like to see them do today, right now? What, Israel? or our, our audience or people out there who are watching, what can they do to help Israel and the cause of Israel? They have to make sure that they make their voice heard in Washington in the most forceful way, in every way that it takes to make it clear that we have as a nation, the United States, been the principal supporter of Israel and has basically protected Israel's back. And let's hope that this administration does not veer from that policy. Mortimer Zuckerman, thank you so much for joining us on JBS. Thank you very much. I have the enormous pleasure of standing with the senator from the great state of Texas. Um, you know, you and I had the pleasure of being honored together, Senator Cruz in the Hamptons, and you were lovely speaking to me then. And I want to say on camera, the way you spoke about the state of Israel, 
was one of the most beautiful things I've heard from anybody who has been elected to the Senate or the House, and you should know that. Thank and I just, I just want to express at the moment, you know, we had this horrible event at the Harnoff Synagogue. Yes. And I'm not, I don't want to set up, I don't need you to bash the president, mm -hmm. but I do want to know your feelings. I want the United States to make a distinction between Palestinian terrorism yes, yes. and Israel's right to defend itself. And I, was a f I, I felt a little bit disappointed that the president made any moral equivalency between parents. I want to know your sense, what, how you felt when you heard this event and what you would like the American people to know and feel about the Israeli-Palestinian struggle. Well, the, the events from last week were, were, were heartbreaking to, to, to see four Jewish rabbis murdered uh, as, as they prayed to God, to, to, to see blood-spattered prayer shawls uh, are images that, that recall some of the darkest days in our world's history. And to see the reaction to that grotesque act of terrorism, to be Hamas celebrating and Fatah trying to justify it, was both horrifying and clarifying. It makes abundantly clear the different values. Mm -hmm. And we need far more leadership from the United States recognizing that Israel shares our values. Israel's inter interest and America's interest are intertwined. One question for you. Where does that come from in you? Have you been to Israel? Are there things that somehow touched you that give you the insight? I, I've heard you speak many times now. Where does it come from inside Ted Cruz? Well, I've, I've traveled three times to Israel in the last two years. and and. You know, I was raised in Texas, actually, when I, when I was in grade school. The grade school I was in was, was half Jewish. It was started by, by Jewish doctors in Houston. Till I was 10, I thought 50% of the world's population was Jewish. And I came to understand, you know what, one of the things that had a powerful impact on me as a child was the Antebi raid. I was a young boy in the Antebi raid, and it was a moment. You remember the year? Uh, 1976. Yes. And our 200 by 70. It, it, was it the, the, the? I don't know how you say it, but it was the 200th anniversary of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And 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 that was I. I was a, a young boy then, and and to me then, what it struck me was Israel was saying, if you take Israelis hostage, those hostages may die, but you're going to die. It was a clarity and seriousness of thought that frankly struck me then and still today as a very Texan approach. Mm -hmm. It's an approach that says we will do what it takes to do what's right and to protect our people. And I think those values are the very same values America was built on. And, and, and we need to stand together. It furthers both our nations. Thank you, Thank you very much for a moment of your time. And Thank you know, whether you people it. agree with your politics or not, you are a very important voice now in the United States. In Hebrew, we say, Kol Tuv Bahatzlacha. May you have goodness and success, Ted Cruz. Well, thank, thank you very Senator much. Senator Ted Cruz from the state of Texas.